uh, live from digital address GA0066714. This is News 360 coming to you live on news up here at Tadesawe in Kanda. My name is Alfred Okansi. And I'm Natalie Fort. Let's take a look at the top stories this evening. News 360 Headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paid, GT Bank, and Calipo. Speakers and participants at Media General's public forum on vigilantism call for more drastic steps by government and political parties to tackle political vigilantism. Residents of Teshi kick against reopening of Teshi desalination water treatment plant, but officials of Ghana Water Company insist it will be opened. Also ahead this evening, Power Distribution Services Ghana, PDS, allays fears of the public of a return to Doomsong following Tuesday night's power outages. Also tonight, Finance Minister Ken Oforiata gives strongest indication that the city will recover in the next two weeks. Elsewhere on the continent, at least eight children dead and many more trapped after a building containing a school collapsed in the Nigerian city of Lagos. Stay with us here on News 360 for the details of these stories and much more news. You could watch this bulletin all across the world on our website. It's 3news.com. On Facebook, it's TV3 Ghana and DSTV Channel 279. Absolutely. We're going to our first story uh, this evening. And as always, feel free to share your thoughts with us. And the Deputy Communications Officer of the NDC, Kweku Bwahene, is also saying that he's giving his caution statement to the police CID as witness to the leaked tape in which the chairman of the NDC is alleged to have incited supporters of the party to attack key personalities in society. Two other communicators, including Sami Jemfi and Akogan, were also invited. The communication officer, Sami Jemfi, his two deputies, Kweku Bwahin and Akogon, both received invitation to report at the CID headquarters as witnesses to the ongoing investigation involving the chairman of Osuampofu. The NDC communications officers arrived in the company of their legal counsel, including former Attorney General Marietta Briwa Pia Opon and Tony Lether. A member of the NDC legal team, Victor Adawudu, explained what transpired at the meeting. When they came, we came with them. Um, they said they wanted to have a different session. So we are with Kuku yeah, They've asked him the questions, what he knows about it. He said it, and we are taking his statement. I'm sure after the statement, the next thing is that we appeal to the police so that they can exercise discretion by giving us bail. Then after that, we'll move on, on to Sami Jemfi. In a related development, Radio XYZ broadcaster Salifu Maase, alias Mugabe, also made a second appearance at the Criminal Investigation Department to continue with interrogation over an alleged threat on the life of Joy FM's investigative journalist Manase Azuri Awuni. He is assisting the police with any intelligence he may have in connection with the alleged threat on the life of Manasseh Awini. His lawyer, George Lowe, said the police have reviewed a copy of the show on which he is alleged to have made that statement. To the best of my knowledge, it was a program that was reviewed, a section of a program, a segment of a program that was played to us, in which uh, our client is alleged to have, you know, given a warning that if some things don't happen, a particular uh, journalist uh, in the presence of Manasi uh, may get killed, you know, and, and so basically they wanted to know uh, where the, what's, what he knows, basically, so that they can assist the police to get to the bottom of the matter. That's simple. 
In other news, the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament has raised queries on an Auditor General's report citing the Computer School Selection Placement Secretariat for printing duplicate scratch cards amounting to over 1.2 million CDs. The over 640,000 cards were printed between the years 2010 and 2012, but were not used. The Director General of the Ghana Education Service, Professor Kwesi Opoku Amankwa, appeared before the Public Accounts Committee. A total number of 645,900 scratch cards were printed by a company called Jokwat Printing to be used by junior high school students to enable them print their placement forms. However, not all of the scratch cards were used for that purpose. And I'm wondering why the Computer School Selection Placement Secretariat would procure cards in excess of what they need. We, we usually will look at the numbers, who will be writing the exams, and then also look at the possible number of times that people will want to hit the, uh, do the scratching. So we can't be very sure that uh, the, the printed more than what they need. If, for example, at the, um, let's say, 300,000 students are writing the exam, you, you estimate that all things being equal, maybe they will buy at least two cards. So you want to, they will buy two cards, they, because for each card, you have a limited number of times that you can use it. The recording did not come at a cost. The previous years, Mr. Chairman, if we are given time, we'll look at, we'll give you the information on how the cars, how the scratching was done. Thank you. The one of the concerns that emerged uh, from PAC is that some of the officers um, under the Ministry of Education have had to travel uh, very far to account for monies or receipts they have subsequently submitted or furnished the Auditor General's office beyond the period of 2016. In fact, uh, some of the receipts or the monies that, uh, or those infractions that they committed were as low as 50 Ghana cities, 100 Ghana cities, and to some extent, uh, 200 cities, for which they have had to travel all the way from uh, the northern part of the country to come and account for it. This, the Public Accounts Committee feels is unacceptable, and that if they should act within the stipulated time of 30 days for which they have had to furnish the Auditor General with their responses and the appropriate receipts, this would not occur and also put extra financial burden on the officers that are already struggling to make money. Komla Kluche, TV3 News, Parliament, Accra, Ghana. Well, some residents of Teshi here in Accra have kicked against the reopening of the Teshi desalination water treatment plant. They claim the plant has failed to provide good potable drinking water, resulting in illness. Residents have vowed to demonstrate if the management insists on reopening the plant. Daniel Opoko has more. The visibly angry residents claim the desalination treatment plant continually poses a problem to them. They said over the past few years, they have contracted some ailments through drinking from the plant affecting their health. Even more, residents complain drinking the water and using it for other household chores is equally not satisfactory. Residents maintain they receive supply of water from the bone treatment plant only three days in a week. Due to the problems associated with the treatment plant, they have asked the Ghana Water Company to stop its operation. They say good drinking water is necessary, but when you drink from the treatment plant, it's bad, so we don't like it. The 
We are pleading with the president to assist us. We want it removed from the community. When we started using it for food, we had diarrhea and others developed some reactions. The desalination treatment plant has currently been shut down due to problems with chlorine content in the water. Despite these complaints, management is indifferent. Officials insist they will soon reopen the treatment plant despite concerns. Residents are furious. We residents, we are always accused of being disrespectful. We have seen pipes being laid to other areas, but we don't know why they want us to drink from this. If residents of La are drinking portable water, why would they want us to drink from the plant? Residents claim they have petitioned the Council of State and other key stakeholders to resolve the problem, but to no avail. It is our right to decide whether we should drink this water or not. Nobody should force it. If they force us, we will hit the streets. So nothing, nothing will be done. We are serious. We don't want it. They should take it from where they, 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 they uh, take it back from where they brought it from. The Ghana Water Company has, however, declined to speak to TV3 News, claiming the concerns are not justified. Rather, it insisted on reopening the treatment plant in the next few days, saying it pays 1.4 million dollars every month. Ghana Water Company and the Communication Directorate say they are not in a position to respond to the concerns raised by some residents of Teshi who drink from the Teshi desalination treatment plant. All the answers are currently in this building and they are not in a position to respond to those issues. Daniel Opoku, TV3 News, Accra. I will certainly bring you more on that issue in subsequent bulletins. In some other top stories this evening, the Power Distribution Services Ghana, PDS, has allayed fears of a public of a return to power outages, Doomsaw, following Tuesday night's power outage. Public relations officer of the power distribution company, William Boating, said technical challenges are to blame for the latest power fluctuations experienced in Accra and its environs. Here's reports by Godfred Tanam. Some parts of Accra have been experiencing power outages prompting affected residents to link it to a return to Dumso. Social media, especially Facebook, was flooded with complaints of a blackout Tuesday night amidst concerns of lack of a good night's sleep triggered by heat waves. Parts of Accra including Nawoshi, Kwashiman, Odoko, Tema, Kaswa, Sotum, La Paz and Abeka were all plunged into total darkness for several hours. The outages come weeks after the electricity company of Ghana, ECG, handed over operations of the company to the power distribution service which started operations March 1. With a promise by the sector minister of improved service, some Ghanaians have started asking questions. Yesterday, I couldn't sleep. I slept, I think, um, this morning by 7.32, yeah. So, I think it's no good. Colin uh, Actually, from my experience for just only about 24 hours, I don't think they are competent to do the work. In, in relation to last night's doomso or blackout which occurred, I am of much less faith that this is the very first time that hands have changed and They've given the opportunity to a new company, a private company, to take over. I am trusting them to deliver. For now, it's too early to judge, to say that they are not competent, even though it looks largely like if you start something and already what you came to prevent, you know, first one week, whatever, you are experiencing, you are, we are experiencing this. But the public relations office of the power distribution service PDS, William Boatin, said the power outage is as a result of technical challenges from upstream, which has nothing to do with the new managers. Uh, who picks and then transmits, who is the power to our end? What 
uh, occurred uh, yesterday has everything to do with upstream situation not downstream now we'll come downstream to our distribution and we also have some few challenges apart from the system being normalized as we speak i know that around kwashiman Dakuman, we had a transformer blast and so engineers are there from pds working to restore power he said it is too early to blame pds uh, pds is not generating power pds is not doing transmission pda is doing the distribution work of the then gcg but this time around they are bringing superior technology uh, and management into uh, into into our operations as uh, pds and so the assurance is the only that we have to give ourselves some time he is confident pds will save Ghanaians better with the assurance that measures will be put in place in case of any eventuality upstream and they are aware of this because they are they have they have worked for the past hundred years in the industry and they know that we need to to up up our game we need to scale up the the the, the level of our operations and we are not there yet and they are bringing this on board so i am certain that it is good that they have taken over uh, they know what they are coming to do to ensure that we get the best the ghana great company limited gridco has meanwhile accepted blame for the blackout and apologized to Ghanaians. <laughs> Well, it certainly wasn't a good night's sleep no, for no, many for people many. yesterday. Absolutely. It's quite yeah. worrying. But nah, I we'll wasn't see. spared of that heat. It was not pleasant at yeah. all. But uh, Ghana Grid Company is also, that's great call. They are apologizing and saying that all transmission lines have been restored. That's the information coming in from, from Great, Great Co. That's but speakers and participants at the Media General's public forum on vigilantism have called for more drastic steps by government and political parties to tackle political vigilantism in the country. The firm, dubbed Finding Pragmatic Solutions to Violent Vigilantism in Ghanaian Politics, was in partnership with the Star Ghana Foundation. Former BNI director Kofi Bentum Kwansen, who chaired the occasion, said the trend has dark consequences for Ghana's democracy. There must be the informed recognition that the nation is confronted with a tragic problem of vigilantism which constitutes a persistent threat to national peace and security. This has to be addressed boldly and sincerely. But can we do this without a thorough understanding of vigilantism? With all these implications, complications, and nuances? No. We need to grasp fairly the subject of vigilantism if you are to deal with it, very, very simple. If you don't understand the problem, how do you solve it? Contributing to the discussion, Director of Communications for the NDC, Kakere Samoa, said enacting fresh laws will not be the solution to the problem. A lot of people think that security people should be given, that the senior security officers should be given fixed tenures and that they should be independent of political authority. Am I right in saying so? I do not agree with you at all. First of all, policemen, soldiers, they carry weapons. They ought not to be given independence of action. They must be controlled by politicians who have the votes and the mandate of all of you. So that a policeman cannot say that he's going to arrest somebody simply because of it. No, a politician must make that decision. It's very important. So how do you go around it? Elect the correct person. You give proper orders. His counterpart in the MPP, Kofi Capito, thinks the political parties are largely to blame for the trend. Why can't we order the police, any person that misbehaves, go after them? In the United States, when there's issue, they call what is called the National Guards. Okay, we can't live in a country. Mr. Kwansin is a former security couple, and I respect him. The question is, the courts in Ghana, Assuming a police officer is doing the right thing by the constitution or per the constitution, would the court support him in terms of transfer, in terms of demotion, in terms of being sacked? We are in a country under a, a regime, a whole junior police officer who was on patrol on the Cape Coast Road was doing an inspection of a deputy interior minister who felt he was above the law decided to pass, he stopped that 
deputy interior minister. He quickly called the IGP. The IGP sent a Mowak to go and hold that police officer to Accra. Do you think next time the police officer would tempt again? The question is, we know what is wrong with Ghana. Now, on the back of the public discontentment and of the proliferation of violent political vigilantism and its threats to Ghana's democratic stability, Media General Group, in partnership with Star Ghana, earlier today held a public forum to explore pragmatic antidote to the canker. Men dressed in black polo shirts and khaki trousers stormed the Laba Leishi Primary School polling station during the Ayawaso West Wagon by election. The men who were believed to be working for the governing party were alleged to have fired gunshots and slapped the MP for Ningo Pram Pram Samuel George Nete. Many condemned the act and called for investigations. Subsequently, the presidency set up the Justice Emo Shots Commission tasked with unraveling the circumstances surrounding the Ayawaso West Wagon by election violence. President Ekufuado, in his recent State of the Nation address, called on the MPP and the NDC to meet and find ways of disbanding their various vigilante groups. General Manager in charge of news and media, General Ibrahim Asari, in his welcome address said he is hopeful the forum will be beneficial to all stakeholders. It is our hope that our audience and the general public will find this session instructive as we collectively work towards finding solution to the issue of violent political vigilantism. Programs Director of Star Ghana Foundation, Amidu Ibrahim Tanko, urged civil society groups to go beyond the lamentations and engage in satisfactory debates in finding long-term solutions to the menace. All sections of Ghanaian society, civil society, uh, the media, the private sector, should get involved actively, constructively in trying to get this. And of course, when I say constructively, we believe that we need to go beyond the lamentations and see what role we can hold I and mean, we can play to hold our political parties to account. Representatives from the various political parties and civil society groups were present at the event. The theme for the program was finding a sustainable solution to the sketch of violent vigilantism in Ghanaian politics. Let's stay a bit further on this, uh, because uh, Paul Abu, who is uh, with the CDD, that's the Center for Democratic Development, has called for vigilantism to be nipped in the bud. He was also speaking at today's Media General Forum on political vigilantism. Other internal conflicts like chieftaincy conflict, farmer herdsmen, cattle, and protection of legal mining concessions are issues that are of national uh, security interest. So there's a need for us to look at a connection between these things, how people jump from being vigilantes into these other sectors. There's also the need for a concerted, a consistent, and a collective action from civil society to demand an end to this phenomenon of um, political party uh, vigilantes. There's also the need to look at reforming Ghana's security architecture and issues around the general recruitment and appointment of uh, security personnel. You're watching News 360. Let's now turn to IMTN Vig reports this evening as our concerned citizen highlights on inadequate learning materials and the state of a school building at Saboba in the northern region. A school in Sawari district and it was being abandoned since 2011 and it has been it has not been completed they, they, they came and roof it to date they've not come to, to complete it for us when the rain is even coming they run home this is where our students normally sit you can see a teacher teaching them under shed when it is 12 o'clock the teachers they have to close them because the teacher himself, when the wind is blowing, he looks dirty and all things are distracted out here. Teaching and learning is not effective here. We are appealing to those people who are concerned to come to our aid to complete this school for us. 
Grateful for that report. We encourage you to also send to us your video report. You can do so via WhatsApp number. It's 055 143044. Stay with us here on News 360 for the latest of business news. Coming up shortly with Parker Ziasari. Hello, good evening and welcome to the business news segment on News 360. My name is Pa Kwisiasari. To begin with, the finance minister, Ken Oforeta, has given the strongest indication that the city will recover against the dollar in the next two weeks. Uh, he said enough capital injection is, in, is, coming, is coming and is expected to stabilize the local currency. Um, really, I'm very, very confident that a reversal is going to occur and that is going to be pretty stable going forward. Um, we have uh, about $300 million um, dollars coming in from um, Coke, um, Cocoa Board, um, another $600 million also from Cocoa Board um, in about a month or so. Um, today, as you know, we launched um, our Eurobond um, officially, uh, which will be $3 billion. Um, dollars. And, and that should close, you know, within the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, in the interim, we've also gone through Parliament of a bridge um, of 500 to 750 million. Um, that would ensure that there's a smooth transition uh, going forward. Uh, but I think what, um, I mean, foreign exchange is always a price, the demand and supply. And your challenge really as a country is how to structurally change um, in terms of our imports um, versus our exports. I think we are too import dependent and we need to find um, um, strategies um, to change that. Okay. Well, well, whilst at this, you should be worried about the fact that Bloomberg describes uh, the Ghanaian currency as the cheapest on the continent. Yeah, it's, it's really not healthy for Ghanaians to repeat such things <laughs> uh, because I mean the truth of the matter is is to is to look at uh, the fundamentals in our country and to think that um, something that just occurred um, uh, will describe the currency in this way um, inflation is at um, um, single digits which is good um, growth has been strong um, six percent um, through um, the third quarter of last year. Uh, our budget deficit, um, as you know, uh, has gone down, you know, in a strong way. Um, and we are also getting um, surpluses in our current account. Um, so really, um, you know, a blip. And if you look historically, I think in 2017, um, uh, until we came through with the $2.25 billion um, <coughs> Um, CD equivalent, um, you also had that type of shakeup. I think it went down 6% and then stabilized. At the end of the year, we were at about 4.9%, which was a far cry uh, from the 8 odd percent we got. Um, last year, even uh, with the jitters and the strengthening of the US dollar, uh, we ended up at about 8% um, depreciation, uh, which was good. Um, I'm confident about the reversal and the stability of the currency. What I'm saying is that with the resources um, that we are going after, 300, 600, another 750 and 3 billion, uh, we should be okay. And all of this should happen you know, within the next two or so weeks. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so we wait to see what happens to the local currency uh, after the injection of some more capital uh, from the Cocoa Syndicated loan, uh, as well as the proceeds from the Eurobond that's just been launched today. Well, away from the local currency, inflation for February 2019 was 9.2%. This was a marginal increase of 0.2 percentage points uh, from the 9.0% recorded in January. This means that the change in the general price level was 9.2% over the one-year period from February 2018 to February 2019. The monthly change rate for February 2019 was 1%. This means that the general price level went up by 1% between January 2019 and February 2019. The food inflation rate for February 2019 was 8.1% compared with 8% recorded in January 2019. The non-food inflation rate for February 2019 was 9.7%.
compared with 9.5% recorded in January 2019. The non-food inflation rate of 9.7% is 1.6 percentage points higher than the food inflation rate of 8.1%. The inflation rate for imported items was 10.6% in February 2019, compared to the 10.8% recorded in January. The rate of inflation for locally produced items was 8.6% in February 2019, compared to the 8.3% recorded in January 2019. The inflation rate for imported items in February 2019 of 10.6% was two percentage points higher than the, that of locally produced items, which is 8.6%. All right, so away from inflation, Union Oil Company Limited is to roll out new initiatives in the petroleum industry to make the company competitive on the international market. The competitiveness officials say will position Union Oil as the top oil marketing company in Ghana and the rest of the world. Chief Executive Officer Charles Obin Mensa was addressing the media to launch the company's 10 years anniversary celebrations in Accra. Union Oil Ghana Limited is a full-fledged member of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, OMC, in Ghana. It has been in existence since 2009 and it is aiming at becoming one of the top five indigenous oil marketing companies in the country. Currently, it has about five outlets in Accra, most of which are stationed in the western region with over 272 workers. Ten years on, the chief executive, Charles Obi Mensa, is elated about the prospects of the company. We have a very good relationship with KNUST. We assisted them to put up uh, their solar lighting system. And we also offer assist in scholarships to needy but brilliant students. And apart from that, we also uh, do that one personal, interpersonal scholarships for students who come here, not necessarily for KNUSD. We intend to extend the scholarships to cover other tertiary institutions. General Manager of the Union Oil Company Limited, Ransford Kisiapia, acknowledged the difficulties in the economy but was hopeful government will maintain macroeconomic stability. Since the petroleum price deregulation was uh, introduced, the government does not have any hand in determining prices. It has been left to the BDCs who import the refined product, who then will determine the prices based on the price on the international market and the exchange rate. So if we are able to keep our CD dollar exchange rate stable and international prices are also stable, there is no reason for prices to change. But uh, I'm sure the government is doing everything possible to address this to make sure that um, there is price stability to a large extent. The chief executive officer of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, Kwekwa Jimandia, is confident Union Oil will be a trailblazer in the next few years. As part of the 10 years anniversary celebrations, the company recommissioned its Dakuman branch to serve neighboring communities. The new branch will also serve the needs of motorists at a discounted price of 5 CDs 15 pesos per liter to 5 CDs 5 pesos. Well, that's all for the business news segment on News 360. My name is Parker Siasari. For more business news stories, do log on to our website, 3news.com. Right, so tonight we start with some other bad news. Celebrated Ghanaian scholar and ethnomusicologist Professor Emeritus Joseph Hansen Kwabnanketia has passed on. Aged 97, the iconic composer and patriot died on Wednesday dawn at the Ligon Government Hospital. His composition and scholarly writings has helped shape African studies. Here are excerpts of his last interview with Uwusu Warai. I started in uh, junior school, senior school and so forth and I was determined at that time 
to go to a Kropon college because I heard of Amu from there. I had a scholarship to go to the School of Oriental Studies in London for a two-year uh, study in linguistics. Okay. And I took the opportunity to study my music as well. It was the basis of my musicianship. Professor Emeritus Joseph Hansen Kwabnankitia, the godson of famous composer and nationalist Ephraim Koku Amu, is hailed the world over for his impressive compositions. <laughs> Born in June 1921, the trailblazer and scholar is acclaimed for his poetic style of composition, often interwoven with moral lessons for his audience. The legendary composer is saluted for his well-researched lyrics and classics. Do you remember your first major composition? Um, well, yes. It's such a long time ago. <laughs> First composition. Yes, the first composition was Unyamani and I would offer. Only pet in ye, your young companion, only pet in ye, your companion, Unyamani, the car won't want more profopo, would offer beginner work here so I disagree. No, I'm a whole. And I'm the dick. Which year was that? Oh, this, this is, I'm talking about 1944. Unyamani. <laughs> I want to know the thinking that went into Winyamani, that composition. Well, Winyamani and I don't know. It is a, a key version of a friend in need is a friend indeed. You find those who love you are when you, you are in trouble because they come to, to sympathize with you. So, Winyamani, you are in if of a good friend who will save you when you are in trouble. And I, I liked it because it's, uh, it was proverbial and it was telling us uh, something about human nature. It's been over 73 years after this song was composed, but one finds it easy relating to the lyrics. What will make a song live beyond seven decades and still remain relevant? Yes, I was imitating the traditional way of composing songs. Songs that are relevant because you are talking about that incident in your life, or the life of other people, what you are thinking, and so on. So that your song is not just just words, but something conveying an experience that you share with other people. And of course, he happens to be the grandfather of Manifest. Let's still stay with him. Now, a glance at late Professor Nketia shows aside music. The legendary composer took pride in his family. In this report, Ousu Arai walks us through Prof's living room where he exhibits the things he cherished most. Meet Professor Emeritus Kwabenan Katia, a celebrated composer, scholar, writer, instrumentalist, Guinean patriot and a living legend. The iconic composer is celebrated the world over for his special gift. A glance at a trailblazer's living room gives an idea of the things he cherishes most, family, music, gratitude and excellence. There you go. Family means a lot to the role model. This priceless photograph with his daughters found a space in his sitting room. One again finds many awards and citations, epitomizing excellence and his hard-earned achievements. One more thing fills the iconic musicologist with pride, the exploit of his award-winning grandson, Manifest. I'm an expensive guy, you want to decide, a stronger with a guy. Proud display his living room, his portrait of an image he cherishes so much. The companion of the other star, Anna, received inevitably 
proud of dance and exploit. As the and the sense of that's that's a way of communicating through music. And he's got it. You were excited when you see him on telly. Well, yes, I, I didn't think that uh, he will come to the world to do that, but he's doing it. So I'm proud that he's doing it. Always inventing ways of communicating. Certainly, Manifest picked up many traits from his composer grandfather. Music indeed runs through the family. Of course, you can indeed say music runs through the family. That's about it for Entertainment News tonight. That's more on 3news.com. I'm Maria Masayajima. Have a good evening. Yeah, good evening, Maria. It does. Um, he rests in perfect peace. Certainly he's but the good thing is, you know, he left his memoirs and yeah, he, he documented so there's a lot, his work. So there's a lot to still you know, catch so up. It's great it's stuff it's there. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but on behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you. My name is Alfred Okansi. I'm Natalie Force. Do visit our website. It's 3news.com for a lot more news. Thanks so much for watching and have a pleasant evening.